Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear viewers, welcome back to another live edition of Ask Wada. Our phone numbers should appear on the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions, please dial any of the following numbers beginning with the other code 002, 001, 3614891503, alternatively 001, 3478060025. And uh, the local numbers, area code 002, then 01005469323. And finally, area code 002, then 02385134. Our first caller for the day is Mudaffar from India. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Mudaffar, welcome to Ask Huda. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, I am from Kashmir in India. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Suppose if a person walk during the night and can he go for the istinja? Yeah. If a person walk for the fajr prayer, mm -hmm. can he go for the istinja before making the wudu? wudu? I don't see where is the problem. Any time, not only Fajr prayer, any time a person wants to do istinja before performing wudu yeah. and praying, w w what is the problem then? Yeah, yeah. During, during the night time, for example, a person will walk for the Fajr, fajr prayer. Can he, can he make the istinja for the wudu? Yeah, Mudaffar, I hope inshallah you clarify your question further. Okay, I guess I guess you're talking about if somebody can just get up from sleep and make wudu and pray. Is it permissible? Yes, it is permissible. Why? Istinja is only compulsory upon answering the call of nature. Okay? So if somebody went to the bathroom, if somebody had to do number one or number two, he have to do istinja. I woke up an hour later, four hours later, and I want to catch up Fajr. So I don't have the urge of answering the call of nature. I don't want to use the bathroom. Can I just make wudu right away? Yes, it is permissible. So once again, in other words, istinja before wudu is not required unless if you happen to answer the call of nature. By the way, istinja is not required in the case of breaking wind. It's only due to defecation or urination. Barakallah fikum mudaffar from India. This is very important to comprehend, brothers and sisters. When Allah the Almighty says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ جُنُبًا فَاتَّهَّرُوا In the state of Janaba, you must perform a ghusl to lift the measure, and it would lift the minor impurity as well. So there are traditions before performing wudu, which is washing one's private, washing the hands, then washing one's private, performing wudu. All of the these are recommended sunan. If somebody didn't do any of that and said Bismillah and he washed the entire body with the intention of performing wudu, is it permissible? Is it valid? It's valid. Somebody who doesn't have urine incontinence. Regularly he goes to the bathroom, he answers the call of nature, and uh, it's okay and everything is regular with him. So at any time he wants to make wudu, does he have to go to the bathroom in order to wash his private or their private first? No, not necessary. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith, when he passed by the graves of two men, obviously of the sahaba, then he paused and he said, إِنَّهُمَا لَيُعَذَّبَانِ وَمَا يُعَذَّبَانِ فِي كَبِيرٍ Indeed, both of them are undergoing severe torment in their graves. This is a sound hadith. Then he remarked saying, and indeed they are not being tormented for a major thing, not a major sin, a major thing to avoid. It was easy to avoid. It was very affordable. What is it? أَمَّا أَحَدُهُمَا فَكَانَ لَا يَسْتَبْرِئُ مِنْ بَوْلِهِ One of them used not to wash after passing urine. 
not necessarily washing with water. al istibra or al istinja is to clean up one's private after answering the call of nature, whether doing number one or number two. In the past, it wasn't that convenience to find water to wash one's private. And that's why they used to use stones. As long as you avoid the bones and the animal dung and the remains of other animals, then it is perfectly fine. So they used to use stones, hijara, minimum three stones. If you think that it is needed to use further until you make certain that no remains of impurities, whether of number one or number two, then use as much as you want. And then when you throw it in the desert, because in the past they didn't have bathrooms and the bathroom facilities were not in their homes. They thought this is disgusting. Nowadays, people have in their master bedrooms, shower, place, bathroom, commodes, and, and all of that. So what we mean is whether you use tissues, napkins, or if you are in outdoor in the desert or on the beach and use stones, all of that is permissible upon answering the call of nature. If you didn't have the urge and if you did not uh, answer the call of nature, then it's okay, you can make wudu right away. Even if you're not making wudu, you should clean up after answering the call of nature as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Zakaria from Kenya. Assalamu alaikum Zakaria. Yeah, go ahead, Zakaria. Welcome to Ask Wada. Thank you, thank you, Sheikh. So, um, uh, I have a question like uh, I wanted to recite a uh, surah so that she, if you could see that uh, how I am reciting because I am I am learning the Quran by myself and by Tajweed. But I don't have a teacher nearby me. Taib allow me to give you a nasiha. First of all, Allah appreciates your effort of learning the Quran. But secondly, the way you said that you're learning Quran on your own and tajweed is not the correct way, unfortunately. Because there is no way that you can pronounce the letters from their articulation points and know the characteristics of the letters on your own. Literally, there is no way. No one can learn calligraphy on their own. Uh, you can be talented in drawing, but to draw professionally, you need uh, somebody to teach you, a tutor. Uh, you can never learn anatomy on your own. Uh, through reading in books, you have to have a professor who will teach you everything about anatomy. Tajweed and language is like that, especially the Quran. So please, do yourself a favor. There are many schools online. Huda Academy is available online. Sign up for the Quran and Tajweed class and you will benefit a great deal, inshallah. And for yourself and the rest of the respected viewers, we have a program every Thursday where we take the calls for people who would like to recite the Quran and then we check the recitation and correct if it is needed. Thank you, Zakaria from Kenya. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salman from India, welcome to Ask Uda Salman. Yes, assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think my question is, I know that a quick shower with the ranging of mouth and nose uh, to uplift a major impurity is sufficient for wudu. And we do not have to do wudu separately after this, and we can pray directly. But if someone touches his private part for washing during this wudu, so does he have to do wudu separately? Because touching of the private part uh, breaks the wudu that is uh, included in this wudu. Got and this question. is my question and uh, may Allah record you and your family Amen. and the brothers in the control room Amen. and uh, may all of you pleasing to him. I mean, same to you, Akhi Salman from India. We welcome your call and all the callers and the viewers. May Allah bless you all. Bismillah. We got to distinguish between two things. Ghusl, ghusl. 
with the intention of lifting a major impurity and ghusl whenever it is mere recommended like ghusl for Jumu'ah, ghusl for the Eid prayer, ghusl for Ihram, ghusl for Tawaf, ghusl for entering Mecca or ghusl for freshening up. The ghusl which is mere recommended, wudu will not be included unless if you make an independent wudu while you are in the bathtub or taking a shower. So wudu will be required to be done in the same order. Wash your hands, rinse your mouth and nose, wash your face, the arms, wipe over your head, wash your feet, right and left. But if you're performing ghusl to left a major impurity after sexual relations, intimate relations, sexual discharge, or with dreams, or a woman after her period, so Bismillah, what are you doing? I'm taking a shower with the intention of performing ghusl to lift the major impurity. So this ghusl is sufficient for wudu and ghusl together. This is something that I wish all the viewers will comprehend. Fact number two, with regards to touching one's private with the palm, right or left, whether accidentally or on purpose, would that invalidate the wudu? There is a difference of opinion because there are two conflicting evidences. So there is a long discussion. And when it comes to wudu, I say to be in the safe side, make another wudu. If you happen to touch your private, you private, not the area around, with your hand, then in this case you should perform another wudu. In order to come out of the dispute, which is a valid dispute among the scholars as a state because of two different narrations. So it is best to make another wudu. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Fatima from the USA, welcome to Ask Uda. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Fatima. Alaikum assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. How are you, brother? I'm doing great, alhamdulillah. And yourself? Good, alhamdulillah. Um, I have a question. My mom is the, um, so my grandmother passed away, right? And she used to get the pension from my grandfather who passed away a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So when my grandmother passed away, now there is nobody. So according to the law in India, the pension should go to the first widow in the family, which is my mom. So she gets the pension but uh, my question is, does anybody else, her brothers or sisters, does anyone else have the right on that pension? Or does that belong to my mom? Or what can she do with that money? So those, that's the question. Okay. When somebody dies and he leaves any wealth, whether in the form of cash or a retirement fund, and I would like to differentiate between the salary that the widow would receive on monthly basis, the salary that the widow would receive on monthly basis from the government versus a fund that retirement fund, like a lump sum or properties or wealth. In the case of a lump sum or retirement fund, it must be distributed among the ears according to the inheritance law in Islam, even if the government says otherwise, okay? So not her brothers, not her sisters, rather the brothers and sisters of the dead person, in case that he did not have children. But obviously, if he have children and he has a wife, then the wife and the children will be the eligible ears. If he have parents, each one of them will get one-sixth of the inheritance, and the wife will get only one-eighth of the inheritance, then the rest will be divided among the sons and daughters. If no one is there to inherit, it will be entirely the wives. But when the government says, this is a payment to the wife to support her after the death of her husband, so it is her money. And if she has orphans, youngsters, she will eventually support them from this fund. She will spend on them out of that. But grown up and independent, and everyone is making their own earning based on the agreement between the person and the government or the employer that this is to be given to your wife 
and the minors, if there are any minors. There are no minors. So it will only go to the uh, wife, the widow. So it is hers. Sometimes they say if the father have daughters who are not married yet, so the inheritance, I'm sorry, the pension plan would be given to the mother and the daughters who are not married yet, then they enjoy it. This is perfectly legal. Thank you, Sister Fatima from the USA. Sister Khadija from the USA, welcome to Ask Huda. Sister Khadija, Assalamu Alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu shaykh. I hope you and your family are doing well. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, I have a question for you, Chef. Bismillah, go ahead. Yes, I work for a retail company okay. where we create the coupons that we send to the customers, you know, for free cookies, free drink, free uh, cook, etc. But now I change department where I have to create reports. Now, one person who used to work there created a report where they were keeping track of sales of alcohol. And now it's my task to maintain that report, make sure it's running every day. Now, what is the ruling of Islam? Is this now making my job haram because of the document that I have to maintain that I include the sales of alcohol? That was my question, Sheikh. Jazakallah khair. Okay. So adding any alcohol by any percentage deliberately to the product that you're producing and it is edible is absolutely not permissible. Alcohol is najis, alcohol is forbidden to serve, is forbidden to add, even as additives to the main ingredients. So it is not permissible to add alcohol to the product that you're making. And if you do this or you supervise that, this is haram. May Allah guide us to what is best. Thank you, Sister Khadija from the USA. And my dear viewers, it is time to take a short break. And inshallah, I'll be back in a few minutes. Get your questions ready and we'll receive your questions shortly, inshallah. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back my dear viewers to the second segment in today's program Ask Huda. Once again our phone numbers should appear on your screen so if you have any questions please dial any of the following numbers as well as you can send your questions via typing on the comment bar whether on the YouTube channel or the, my Facebook page. Assalamu alaikum. Sajar from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum Sajar. Wa alaikum salam, Sheikh, how are you? Alhamdulillah, Sajar, how are you? I am good, Alhamdulillah. Sir, I have a question that uh, once uh, my mother called uh, Lumber and uh, to clean uh, kitchen which was blocked, uh, the gutter line was blocked. Mm -hmm. So he, he cleaned the gutter line but uh, uh, in order to wash his hands, he went outside. Mm -hmm. So there was a door and he he went outside and uh, there was a uh, water null outside and he washed his hands over there. So I, I uh, later on when I asked mom that uh, whether he washed his hand in the kitchen uh, after cleaning the gutter or he didn't. So she said she he went outside, so then uh, I checked the track, there was any traces and I also I checked the uh, outside. So, Sagar, then, uh, so <clears throat> Sagar, what is your question? My question is that uh, today when I uh, was uh, wearing my clothes and I actually thought that I didn't check the uh, the handle of the door properly and maybe the inside of the door he touched with something like nudges and, okay. and maybe all the, Saga, the... Yeah, I know where you're coming from. Let me tell you this. When I clean the gutter, it's dirty but it is not nudges. You know what najasa means? 
نجاسة is not every dirty object rather it's a specific thing like urine drops stool uh, feces uh, or the licking of a dog the saliva of a dog none of that it's maybe dirty but it is not something that you need to wash to pray so if it is raining and you become all muddy can you pray in this condition it's permissible because it is not nudges. Somebody who's cleaning, cleaning the gutter, his hands are not nudges, are not impure. He's tahir. But maybe there he needs to wash his hands. So he held the handle of the door with his hand. Don't worry about it, no problem. Where he walked, where he washed his hands and he soiled everywhere with the droplets of water after washing his hands, all of that is not nudges. So you don't need to wash your clothes, you don't need to wash your hands. There is a difference between a specific dirtyness, which is najasa, and generally speaking, we say it's dirty, it doesn't look clean. Okay? So what is uh, haram and what is a must to clean up before offering the prayer? A najasa due to urine drops, blood, feces, and obviously, uh, and, and vomit, and uh, obviously the najasa, the saliva of a dog. Barakallah feek, akhi. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Fatima from India, welcome to Ask with a Fatima. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Fatima, how are you? I'm fine, alhamdulillah, shukran, how are you today? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, Fatima, barakallah feek. Hello? Yes, Fatima, do you have a question today? Yes, I have a question and a request. Okay. So my question is, sometimes usually after school, um, I have extracurricular activities and functions and etc. So usually I tend to, I forget Bahar, the whole, I forget whole of Bahar. I come home at 3 and by, and by the time I come home, Bahar gets Hala. And mm. I just, and, and then I do play Lohar, but I'm not playing it during its time. I'm playing it in Asr. And mm. I, I just try it. Okay, because it's not like I, I'm not, it's, I'm not able to play it, and I don't want to play it. Yeah. Because the school, run, by the time I come home, it becomes three, and by the time, so Asr, it, it comes off, so I'm, so I'm not able to play Lohar in this time. And is it okay if I do that or not? Because I have other extra prayer. Yeah, and Fatima. Fa Fatima, can you hear me? And I really hope, I really wish you could get it. Fatima, I have a couple questions for you. Number one, how old are you by now? Fatima? Hello? Yes, Fatima, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, first of all, how old are you? You're 14, okay. At your school, is there a place where you can offer your prayer or not? No. They don't allow that? Uh, no, but it's not, I can't pray there. I'm asking once again, if you decided to pray, you and the Muslim girls and boys at school, they would tell you, no, you don't pray? You can't pray? No. What, what do you mean no? They don't allow you, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me answer you, Fatima. I, I initially asked her how old are you in order to know whether she's mukallaf or not. Because when somebody was underage, yani you did not reach the age of puberty yet, we say no problem. Because the prayer is not compulsory on him or her yet. It's highly recommended. But it's not compulsory. So even if they wait until they come home and they pray Dhuhr and As, they combine them together, it's easy, affordable, no, no problem. But for a person who's mukallaf, have reached the age of puberty, he and his dad, she and her mom are the same with regards to a taklif, that they have a duty that they should fulfill, which is offering the prayers on time. Allah the Almighty says, in chapter number 4, Surah An-Nisa, 
إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا Well, certainly Allah has ordained the prayers on the believers at fixed times. Zuhr has a time, Asr has a time. It's permissible due to necessity, urgent and pressing causes, to combine two prayers which share the same time, like daytime, Zuhr and Asr, nighttime, Maghrib and Ash, at the time of either one of them. But it is not permissible to do it without pressing cause, without uh, a need. Somebody is sick, somebody was asleep, uh, somebody was taking the finals. There is a, a heavy rain, so the Imam of the Masjid said, we won't be able to come for Aisha, let's pray Aisha along with Maghrib and you guys don't have to come. These are all permissible causes. I go to school and we get really busy. Number one, there is no school from 7 or 8 a.m. till Asr. There is no school in the world where you can take all these times, okay? So, I'm sure you finish. Uh, you have a break. During your break, you should pray dhuhr. And if there is a Muslim community, so the parents should demand that we need a room for our kids to offer the prayers. We offer the prayers on time. During the break, it's my break. Some teachers and grown-up students will go and smoke. I want to offer my prayer. I'm sparing some of my time where I can take lunch or uh, drink something to offer the prayers, to be in the safe side. I understand that sometimes people put their kids in international schools and they say, we have a policy, no prayers at school. Then hell with you. I'm saying it point blank with the school. I'm not signing up my kids in a school where they prevent my son from praying. They teach them sexual education sessions and the rights of every uh, trans and every LGBT or whatever. And they come to the prayer and say, no, you don't have the right to pray. I don't want such education. I don't want my son or daughter to be in such school. And a parent who would agree to that is blameworthy. You know, I don't like to sugarcoat certain matters. I like to give it to you as is. Because the Almighty Allah said in the Quran, in Surah Al-Tahreem, in Ayah number 6, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu ku anfusakum wa ahlikum naran wa quduha al-nasu al-hijara. So I'm required to look after myself, my wife, my children, my offspring, to protect them again as the fire of hell. The main pillar of Islam is al-salah. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was asked about the best deed ever, he said to offer each and every prayer on its earliest time, not just time. As-salatu ala awwali waqatiha. So may Allah the Almighty bring to our hearts and minds the importance and the significance of being religiously committed and inspiring our children at a young age to also be religiously committed. We give priority to math classes, to piano classes, to ballet classes, to soccer classes, and school activities over the prayers? No way. The prayers should come number one. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. from United Arab Emirates. Welcome to Ask Koda Mas'ud. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, Sheikh, my question is, uh, when I pray with you by making the intention to pray three rakahs together, that is, without sitting in the second rakah, if in case I forgetfully sit in the second rakah, but recite the tashahud and midway, I remember it. So, would I have to perform sajda to sound? This is a witr prayer, correct? And Yes, this is the witr prayer. Yes, you should pray surudu sah. Okay. So it all depends on the intention. Yes, because you've added something that is not in the prayer. Yes, okay. Second question, please. And my second question, Sheikh. Yeah, that's, that answers my question. My second question, Sheikh. Uh, it is related to perform, performing ghusl for the deceived. Mm-hmm. Uh, so is there any recommended series from Huda TV channel that I can refer? 
uh, you know, demonstrating how to perform the ghusl for the deceased? That's a very interesting question. I think we do have a series. I don't know where we can find it in the archive. And if we can find it, then that's a good idea to actually film a series about ghusl on mayyit and also the takfin and the burial process. So everything from death to uh, the uh, burial, uh, if we don't have one, it's a good idea to start filming one. Thank you, respected brother, for bringing this to our attention. And brothers and sisters, it is time to take a break. We'll be back, inshallah, in a couple minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. We have our first caller for this segment, Brother Abdul Rahman from Italy. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Ask with Abdul Rahman. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam, akhi. Welcome to Ask with. Go ahead. My question is, uh, my first question is uh, that I, I have a classmate who is Peruvian and he owns a dog, you know. So uh, he, he comes to the class. Did you get me? You said you have a classmate yes, who is Baralui. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, I, I'm continuing. I have a classmate who is a Peruvian and he owns a dog. And he comes to the class, you know. I do not classes. So the question is, it's the issue of Tahar, you know. I, I sometimes people pick his tablet for needs or uh, for, sometimes I would ask him for pens, you know, just to uh, borrow his pen. I borrow his pen and to, ut to utilize it. So is this a Najasa or Tahar issue? No, this is not Najasa or Tahar issue. Even, let me tell you this. When I shake hand with non-Muslim, yes. uh, would that make me impure? No. When I hug a non-Muslim, would that make me impure? No. The Najasa is not physical. The Najasa is moral and spiritual. Okay? Not physical. So when you shake hands with a non-Muslim, you don't become impure. Barakallahu feek. Uh, brother Abdul Rahman from Italy. Sister Shadia from the USA. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Ask Uda. Walaikum assalam, brother. Uh, I have one question of, regarding the uh, food, uh, halal and uh, haram food. You were saying, I, I heard from your one of, one of the brothers asked a question about uh, halal, haram food, and you said, uh, for book, uh, no, the food from people of the book is uh, is permissible. But uh, as long as I, like I see sometimes a lot of contamination, right? But they are, for example, they are frying the egg right there. They are cooking a bacon. And uh, at the same time, you know, all this food is getting contaminating with each other. And for, for, for example, Jewish people, they use a lot of wine on their food. So... I mean, how these foods are permissible because we don't they are know not what permissible. happening. This is not permissible. Shazia, what you've just mentioned is not permissible. If I go to any of the stores, any of the restaurants, I don't have to mention names because I usually like to go to particular restaurants like IHOP, uh, Danny's, and Pancake House. And then you eat pancake and syrup and all of that. And then once the owner showed me how they cook and they even fry the eggs and they do the meat, everything on the same grill. So the lard and the fat of the sausage and all, it's, it's all mixed. And he alerted me to that. Okay? So if you go and you know that, please use a new frying pan, not on the same grill. And they do so, fine. But otherwise, it's haram. Because it's not just contaminated, it is cooked with haram and along with haram. And this is not professional, this is not uh, compliant with the law, but this is what they do in many places. So if you know that they added anything that is haram or it's cooked on the same grill uh, where other forbidden items have been cooked, it's not permissible. No Muslim would tell you it's okay to eat it because now it is contaminated with what is absolutely forbidden. 
And please, I would like to distinguish between two major issues. When somebody says, Ya Sheikh, is the meat which is slaughtered by the people of the book, the Jews or Christians, halal or haram, do I have an opinion? Allah said in the Quran, وَطَعَامُ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ حِلُّ لَكُمْ وَطَعَامُكُمْ حِلُّ لَهُمْ It is not me. This is what Allah said in Surah Al-Ma'idah, uh, number five, chapter number five. This is what Allah said in the Quran. طَعَامُ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ حِلُّ لَكُمْ uh, who is the best professor of the Quran? Turjumar Quran, Abdullah ibn Abbas said the word ta'ab refers to the meat. Was Prophet Muhammad وسلم, ever invited by Jews or by Christians? They slaughtered for him a sheep and he ate out of it? Of course. And this is confirmed in the sound hadith. You turn around and you're going to say, but they don't slaughter, they kill or they use a stun gun, or they electrocute. This is an entirely different issue. So this is haram. This is absolutely forbidden. Even if it is done by a Muslim, and if a Muslim held a gun, and he shot a cattle in the brains, and it died, even if it said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and he pulled the trigger, it's dead, it's called mayta. You don't eat it. Okay? The word zabiha means it has been slaughtered. Somebody would say, but the people of the book, they don't say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I know. And that's why they're not Muslims. But how dare you say it is halal to eat the zabiha of Ahl al-Kitab? It's not me, Allah, the one who said it. And the Prophet ate from the sheep which was slaughtered by the Jews. And he said Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim because it was slaughtered. Okay? So this is one category that we have to be very clear about it. There is no khilaf in this uh, point of view. The problem is, number one, when we don't know whether it was slaughtered by people of the book or by atheists, by Hindus, by Buddhists. You know, it's a mixed community. This is a problem. Second problem, they don't slaughter a sheikh, they kill. Then it's haram, no questions asked. Oh, in the restaurants where they, they cook the, the biha or whatever, they mix the meat. They, say, they cook on the same grill. Uh, pork shops and lamb shops and beef shops, haram. Don't eat it because it's cooked on the same grill, contaminated with what is haram. May Allah guide us what is best. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Omar from the USA, welcome to Ask Huda Omar. Omar, can you hear me? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ask Huda, Brother Omar. Go ahead. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question. Um, I'm not sure if I My family um, uh, here in America, they um, eat the normal uh, meat that's sold. I just want to ask how it's, uh, uh, how it's, uh, how I can navigate, uh, like helping them cook and if they ask me to make them food when uh, the question I was just, of the opinion. Omar, your question was just answered a couple minutes ago. So once we finish this episode, you listen to minute 45. You know, you pause at 45 and you watch the answer to this question. Barakallah of you. Thank you, Brother Omar from the USA. Maybe you can accommodate another question. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. Bismillah. Abdullah from Bangladesh. Welcome to Ask with Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum. wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead, Brother Abdullah. Can you make your question quickly, please? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. What is your question, brother? Unfortunately, we can't wait for long. We're going to take another caller, bro. Assalamu alaikum. Umayr from Nigeria. Please, Umayr, present your question right away. 
Jazanaikum. Thank you, Umayyar. What is your question? Uh, my question is uh, I want more explanation about the hadith of the Prophet that said uh Zahaba is Zahabi illa Matalabi Matal. Uh illa Mislam bi Mithl. The hadith the hadith is something that touches our daily activities. And a lot of Muslims, Akhi Umayr, are falling into this violation unknowingly. So my wife, I bought her jewelry when we got married a long time ago. Now she says, honey, it has become very old and I want to buy a new set. No problem. So we weighed them and they happen to be 200 grams. We went to the jewelry shop and said, we want another 200 grams. They said, yeah, but you would have to pay difference because this is old and this is new. How much difference? Well, you can take your 200 gram and give you 190 because this is new and old. In the case of gold, in the case of silver, in the case of barley, in the case of salt, there are several, uh, uh, seven items. And Nabi Sallallahu said, when you exchange them, like gold and silver, they must, they must fulfill two conditions. The measure and the weight is the same. The second condition is, you know, handing over the exchange should happen simultaneously at the same time in the city. So I took my wife's jewelry to the shop and I said, here is 200 gram, but this is old. I said, the new fashion one, 200 gram will cost you extra. No problem. How much you pay uh, 2,000? This extra is riba. So what is the best way to do it? Here is a 200 gram bracelets, necklace, rings, whatever, earrings. How much would you buy them for? Bismillah. He bought them for $6,000, for instance. And now, what would you like, honey, of the new stuff? Okay, because of the manufacturing, you pick whatever and you pay cash or with your card in a new transaction. But in case of exchanging, exchanging gold for gold, it must be the same weight. Silver for silver must be the same weight. Dates for dates, barley for barley, same date. Okay? I'm same measure, if you're following the measure. Same weight, same measure, and in the same sitting. If you want to do, you know, differently, then sell what you have for any other currency, if they deal with gold, if they deal with silver, if they deal with cash, and then buy the new stuff in a new transaction, then both of you are not blameworthy. Thank you, respected brother from the USA, I believe. Umayyad from Nigeria. Lebanon, Abdullah from Lebanon, final caller for the day. Assalamu alaikum. Go ahead, Abdullah. Wa alaikum salam, Sheikh. How are you? I'm doing great, alhamdulillah. And yourself? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Dear Sheikh, I want to ask you two questions, actually. Mm -hmm. My first question is regarding the tashahud. Mm -hmm. When I'm praying, I finish my two rak'ahs by mistake. I made the full tashahud, but I don't say salam alaikum rahmatullah. I realize, you know, I made the long tashahud. I get up and continue my prayer. Okay, this is the first question. So I want to know if should I repeat the salah or no? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You are praying two rakas. Your intention was to pray two rakas, correct? It's four rakas, like duhur or asr, four rakas. I pray, uh, when I finish the second rakah, I make the long tashahud by mistake. Oh. By mistake, I make the okay. long tashahud. Okay, so according to Imam Shafi'i, you're not required to offer sujood al sahu. Next question. Okay, regarding the next question is, there is an ayah in the Quran, it says, uh, the people who die shuhada, uh, and they are ahya, ahum ahya, yurzaqoon, and rabbahum, ahya, yurzaqoon. Yurzaqoon, what exactly is meant by yurzaqoon? Are they yurzaqoon in Barzakh, or are they yurzaqoon in heaven? Got what your question, exactly got, your question. got your question, Abdullah. The ayah says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا بل أحياء عند ربهم يرزقون 
In this ayah, Surah Al Imran, the Almighty Allah says, Don't you think that those who die for the sake of Allah, like on the battlefield, dead? No, they're not dead. Rather, they are alive. Where? Inda Rabbihim, with the Lord, Yuzakun being provided. What do you mean being provided? You know, uh, the story is a long story about the battle of Uhud and some of the shuhada, such as Abdullah ibn Haram, uh, the father of Jabir ibn Abdullah, who died and Allah spoke to him. He said, I want to come back to life to tell people about the joy and the light that I'm enjoying so that they don't fear dying for the sake of Allah. He said, we do not return those who die back to life until the day of judgment, but we will convey your message to them. So he revealed these verses. And Abu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, Inna arwaha ash-shuhada'i fi hawasili tuyurin khudrin tasrahu fil jannah. So we're talking about the souls of the shuhada, of the martyrs, not the bodies. Bodies are on earth in their graves. But their souls wander in jannah. Is the provision like edible, something physical? Not necessarily. But you know when you know that food is being served, you're happy, you're delighted, it's served for you, being prepared for you. When you are in the grave and you see that Allah the Almighty has built a house for you in Jannah and you check it out and your soul is in Jannah, you're happy this is a provision, not necessarily eating and drinking physically. Because the actual entrance of Al-Jannah, or God forbid, An-Nar, will be after resurrection and reckoning. May the Almighty Allah grant us all entry to the highest place in Jannah, which is Al-Firdaus Al-A'la. Brothers and sisters, by that <coughs> excuse me. Come to the end of today's edition of Ask Huda. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance And in your deen allow me to advance Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Allah is my heart's speech Mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance And in your deeds